as of yesterday. So uh, it's great for me to be here. It's a great welcome to see the higher ed community and the WordPress community all in one place. Um, so I'm going to be telling everybody a story today, a story about uh, our work on the Central IT website at North Carolina State University. And that story, there's a lot that goes into it. Um, a lot of this I'm not going to get into great detail here, but I do want to say up front there are pieces of it that I'm going to sort of fudge a little bit to make it easier to tell and also make us look just a little bit better. So you're, what you're getting is not the 100% complete truth. If you want to call me out on my lies afterwards, please do. I will tell you all of our dirty secrets. I also want to make a quick comment about my employer, the uh, North Carolina State University Office of Information Technology. Uh, <laughs> I love my job. I love the people I work with. They are fantastic people, and they enable me to keep working for a university in North Carolina while I'm living in Boston. So it's a really special place. That said, I am going to be airing a little bit of dirty laundry, a little bit of a behind-the-scenes look at the terrible things that we do. So I, I want to let you know that what I say, the complaints I have, they come from a place of love and not from a place of bitterness. So let's talk about the story I'm going to tell. And I'm going to tell you up front so you sort of keep an eye on this throughout the moral of our story. And that moral is find ways to trust and empower your content creators. And so keep that in mind as we go. So let's start with a little background. Uh, like a lot of colleges, NC State is big and decentralized, and even the small colleges are small and decentralized, it seems like. Um, <laughs> NC State has 12 different colleges and lots of different college-like entities, things that are big, things that sort of function on their own, that are not colleges, don't necessarily grant degrees, but they might as well be for the purposes of the big university org chart. And since we do not have a campus-wide governance plan, since university communications is mainly responsible just for the core ncc.edu homepage, uh, all of these colleges, all of these college-like entities are responsible for their own web presence and hiring their own web teams. And so we have lots of stuff going on. This is not even a complete list. Uh, we would probably be about twice this if it were a complete list. And everybody has to hire their own web team. That's not always practical in higher ed. There's not actually a lot of money going around, especially at the state institution. And so that's where the group that I work with comes in. I work for a group called OIT Design. We are a design and development group inside of our central IT office. And we're basically a web team for hire. Um, we follow a partial cost recovery model, so we, we charge for our services, but we don't charge much, basically. And that means we're always overworked and don't have a lot of resources or time to do things. And we do a lot of things with that limited amount of time. Uh, uh, custom development, uh, we help people figure out how to manage their content, um, information architecture, usability testing, web hosting support, all these different things that I'm not going to be talking about today. Instead, what I'm going to be talking about today is the thing that we don't do we don't own your website. And this idea of website ownership is something that we haven't even really articulated in our own group very clearly, but it's really central to this talk. Uh, we'll help you run your website, but you own your website, and that means that you're responsible for its content. So when I say that we don't own a website, I say that we don't write copy, we don't decide what needs to be on your website, and we don't decide when your content needs to be updated. So that's everything you need to know about NC State and the group that I work with. So let's talk about the distant past. And the distant past, for me, means everything that happened before I was hired in November of 2014. Um, we have this concept of uh, website ownership, but then there's this question, what about the website for the central IT office, oit.ncc.edu? Who owns oit.ncc.edu? And my answer, for a long time, up until July of 2015, my answer was, not me. Because OIT, uh, OIT Design, like I said, is a web team inside of OIT, but we're very campus focused. We don't focus on our own web presence, so we are not OIT's web team. And that's a distinction that we try to make whenever we can. Um, because, again, we don't write copy, we don't decide what needs to be on the website. So who does? starts us down our path. Uh, this website was launched when OIT was formed by merging two different IT groups on campus in 2008. It was built using cutting edge technology called Drupal 6 uh, by the person who held my job a couple of people ago. 
And while the people at my job built the website, it was owned and maintained, this idea of ownership, by OIT's Information and News Services Group, that is our communications team. Uh, I want to really emphasize how hard of a job our communications team has. They are responsible for uh, communicating our, our message, the Central IT's message, to a campus of 35,000 students and something like 15,000 faculty and staff. We are the largest university in the state of North Carolina. Uh, we are the more important university in the state of North Carolina. Don't ever listen to the UNC Chapel Hill people. Um, and, and a communications team in that sort of environment is doing anything from you know having a booth in the middle of campus trying to get students passing by to sign up for two-factor authentication, to uh, communicating issues about web hosting and outages on campus, to communicating how to set up your phones. We're responsible for the phone system on campus. So they have this huge task, and part of that task was, at the time, maintaining the OIT website. Then came the budget cuts. So, budget cuts are part of life in higher ed, and if any of you work for a public institution, you are at the whims of your state legislature. Um, so, budget cuts came, and those cuts disproportionately hit our communications team. And so, this communications team within the central IT office that had this massive job that they were responsible for was gradually reduced to just one full time position. And Rhonda's great. We love Rhonda. Rhonda is really good at her job. But Rhonda's job is far outside the scope of what one person can reasonably do. So, with that limited staff capacity, the decision was made to try to take a little bit off of Rhonda's plate. And that was that all full-time OIT staff would have equal editing permissions inside the Drupal 6 OIT website. And that seems like a great idea because we're all IT professionals. We all know how computers work. We're all going to be able to figure it out. But that also means that these ownership questions about the website would suddenly become a collaborative 300 person effort. So raise your hand if you think that plan turns out well. All right, we got one person raising a hand. Uh, the rest of you are perhaps more perceptive than Jonathan is. <laughs> so uh, things fall apart because that plan does not work at all. Um, and the, the core problem is that if everyone owns a website, then no one owns a website. Uh, we had a wide variety of things start happening. Um, we ballooned up to 2,576 pages in our website. And I, I want to say OIT does a lot of things on campus. We do touch every part of campus life, but we do not do 2,576 pages worth of things at NC State. Um, we started seeing out of date and duplicated and inconsistent content across all of these pages, orphaned pages that had no links linking to them. I don't know how they ever expected anybody to visit them, but there, were, there was no way to get to them. So many accessibility issues and lots of things that just didn't make any sense. And I'm going to give you an example of all of these things wrapped up together. Um, this was a page that was in our website. It was, uh, it was talking about a past initiative that had concluded in 2010 in which we migrated all of our student email accounts to Gmail or Google Campus. And so that page was visible on our website at oit.ncc.edu slash student email initiative. If you went to slash student email initiative slash test, you saw this page. Uh, and if you can't read that text right there, all it says is this is a test. If you went to slash test dash zero, you saw this page. Um, which is talking about the project that had concluded in 2010 as though it is a current project um, with a beautiful table-based layout and a broken image that has been broken or had been broken since at least 2011. And then if you went to test-1, you had this other page that was all the same information from test-0 expressed in a different way with a different table-based layout. And all four of these pages were live published pages that anybody could get to on the internet. And I know what happened here. What happened here is that uh, while the project was ongoing, they were trying to figure out what's the right way to communicate this information. They created a few different ideas. They talked about it in the committee. We're big on committees because it's higher ed and we all have committees. Um, and then they never went back and cleaned up. And some of that is Drupal 6 was not always a great CMS to work in. And some of that is that 
people just didn't think to go back and clean it up. And I also, while working on this project, I came across my favorite page. Uh, if you can't read that in the back, all it says is, delete me. <laughs> and I found this, and I, I had this moment of realization that our website was crying out for help. <laughs> so, we have over 2,500 pages. We have nobody who's responsible for the ownership of the pages. Dealing with these problems was going to be a huge task, and nobody really wanted to deal with it. Nobody had that in their job description. Nobody had that as something they had the energy to deal with. While all this was happening, the rest of our central IT office started to go rogue because everybody recognized that oit.ncc.edu was a terrible website. It was just sort of understood by everybody in, in the office. And since we are a 300-person IT group, we have lots of IT staff who know some HTML and have access to web servers. And if you see where this is going, uh, teams within OIT started building their own websites. And there was no sort of consistency across our organization of what those websites looked like. There was no consistency of URL structure. There was no consistency of anything whatsoever. And what makes this even worse is that they would create these websites and then abandon them after a few months or a few years too. Because, again, the hard work of maintaining a website is hard work. And that was not part of any of these people's jobs. Nobody really had the, the push or the commitment to actually do it. So just to sort of recap the situation we were in by July of 2015, um, for some OIT services, this is sort of the worst case scenario imaginable, we have out-of-date pages on oit.ncc.edu, duplicated pages on oit.ncc.edu that had contradictory information from those out-of-date pages. Abandoned websites on some other something.ncc.edu that also contained out of date information that was still contradicting the other out of date information on all of the pages in the main OIT website. So, if you were a person looking to get a service through our central IT office, your best option was to pick up the phone and call somebody who was working on that service. And that is a bad look for a central IT office. And it's especially bad on a big campus, again, 35,000 students and 15,000 faculty and staff. This is just, it's not, it's not a good situation. So we had lots of problems, zero website owners, and 300 people who were supposed to be owning the content they created who were really reluctant to do so because that's not part of their job. So something has to be done and I had been hired and I thought I could fix it. And the rest of my coworkers thought, yeah, let's give it to Brian, he's the new guy. <laughs> so, step one was to move everything into WordPress. Uh, our Drupal expertise had left the university and WordPress is better. Hopefully I don't need to make that case to anybody in this room. Um, as part of that process, we trimmed down our pages from over 2,500 to about 700. Truthfully, about 700 is probably still too many. There's a lot of junk in our website, but it's a process. Uh, we totally revamped the information architecture to make sure that there were no orphan pages and to make sure that um, it just made sense how to get to things. We made it mobile friendly and on brand and slightly more modern, and I don't want to oversell the, the modern aspect of it. There's a lot of bad code that I wrote because I don't actually know what I'm doing. <laughs> um, so there's, there's a lot that still needs to be addressed and cleaned up as we move forward. But overall, the, the, the situation was vastly improved. And that is, that is our migration process. Everything that the last two uh, speakers in the higher ed track talked about all condensed down into one slide. This was months of work, and it hurts me that it's only one slide. So step two was then to consolidate all of these road sites that were out there and had their own URLs into a multi-site so that we could at least get things under control. Uh, there was no way we were ever going to get everybody on board with consolidating everything back into the main OI. But we could have consistent branding, and we could have network-wide search tools so that if you're on one site and you're looking for something that's on another, it'll still show up in the search results. And we now we have a workflow for creating new sites, and we have some custom plugins that are just built for OIT that we can all take advantage of, like uh, a plugin that interfaces with the system we use to track when services are down, like when the phones are out or something like that. Now a notification will appear on every website that's an OIT website. And so then step three of our 
big plan was to give all full-time OIT staff content creation and editing permissions in the main OIT website. And that doesn't make a lot of sense, because I just spent the first half of my talk telling you that that was a terrible idea and it ruined everything. <sighs> but we weren't dumb. We, we knew exactly what we were doing. We were just in a difficult spot. We had all these reasons for unhappiness with the existing OIT website that we were working through, and some of these things we could address during the redesign process. Um, make, you know, making it look on brand, making it look uh, uh, up to date, making it mobile friendly, all these things. But these, this top row of items here, out of date content, bad content, and this question of who's responsible for it moving forward, that's not a WordPress problem, that's a process problem. And we set out to fix our business process. And we proposed a new position that would be created that would be sort of a hybrid IT and communications position, somebody who would be our multi-site administrator for Central IT, somebody who would take over the administrative tasks of creating sites and user management, but would also coordinate with all the SMEs to make sure that content was up to date, uh, would work with our communications staff to make sure everything was consistent in our tone and how we're communicating on campus, and ultimately this would be the person who's, whose name is on the website, the person who's responsible for our central IT offices web presence on campus. And our management said no, because the money wasn't there. Because we're in higher ed and we're beholden to the state legislature and sometimes that's how things go. And that was really frustrating for me because I had done all this work to migrate into WordPress or I was doing all this work at the time and I felt like we don't have any, any backing to do anything different. We're going to fix the problems temporarily, we're going to trim down the pages, but in five years or ten years it's going to be just as bad, if not worse. So there was a part of me that wanted to throw up my hands and walk away, but ultimately we decided to try to find a way to make it all work. Step one of making it all work was I thought, you know, we're all IT staff and we all get why this is important, why it's important to have a good website, so I'm just going to send out a unit-wide email to everybody that says, hey, we've made these changes, we've switched to WordPress, this is how you log in, and you should come to the training sessions, I'm going to hold six training sessions, you should all come and meet with me and talk about, like, our new philosophy of doing web in OIT. And I thought, I have solved the problem forever. Everybody will be on board with this. I have written the world's greatest email, and everybody will just flock to my sessions. So I raise your hand if you think this plan turns out well. Yeah, I got no hands this time. Um, so you're all very perceptive. Uh, so attendance was low, uh, and the reason it was low is because nobody in OIT actually wants to be a content creator. Nobody wants that hard work because everybody else has other jobs. If your job is to lay fiber optic cable, you don't really want to not lay fiber optic cable. You, you don't want to go and learn how to manage content on the website. And similarly, you know, all across our organization, there were people who just don't really care about this thing that I was trying to communicate out. But the problem is they want to create content. When they have something they want to communicate out, they want to be able to create it and have it out there, or have somebody to go to to create it and have it out there. Um, they just don't want to have to do the hard work of maintaining it and keeping it accurate and keeping it in the structure of our information architecture. And the real problem I started running into is that in July of 2015, my answer was, I don't own the OIT website. But by January of 2016, everybody else in OIT had a name that they had associated with the website. And so I started fielding all of these questions. I became that owner. And also I kept having to deal with these tasks that were not actually part of my job, because my job is campus facing, help other groups on campus with their websites. It's not my job to decide what goes on the OIT website. So I spent a lot of time fighting this idea, but ultimately I came to realize that the people who had put me as the owner of the website weren't wrong to do that. Because I was so stuck on this idea that we needed to have an owner that I became that owner. I, I was so stuck on this idea that every other organization on campus has one person who's responsible for it, that when I was communicating things out to, camp, or out, uh, out to my organization, I was communicating as though I was that person. And what I really needed to do was to learn how to trust the rest of OIT to manage its content, and to give them the power, empower them with the tools they need to do it right. And so if you 
we're here at Grand Canyon to sell my moral story to find ways to trust in the power in content creators. I told you this would be coming back. So, we came up with a rough idea of a distributed governance plan just for our organization, OIG, um, where OIG Design, the group that I work with, owns the service of the OIG multi-site. So we maintain the multi-site, we do custom development when we need to, and then we also enforce the governance rules um, that come out of this governance plan. But we still draw the line where we draw the line with other clients. We do not own the content. We are not the owners of the content, and we don't make decisions about content. Instead, that's what the rest of OIT does. The rest of OIT individually owns their content in their sections of the website, any services that they're responsible for. So they're the ones who decide when to create new content, when it needs to be updated. And then to help facilitate that, we also created web content liaisons, which is sort of an extra name that got added to people who made the mistake of showing up to meetings. <laughs> um, people who, who seem to have some interest in this whole web thing, keeping our website organized, and who were told by their managers, yes, this is going to be a part of your job. And so we didn't want to overwhelm them with extra responsibilities, but they did become the people that we would sort of put on support tickets as, this is somebody that you should talk to because you have a question about something with, with the website. <coughs> but the problem was I had never actually written a web governance document before, and I'm barely qualified to do the job that I actually have. Now I'm asking to navigate the complicated politics of the university. I didn't really know what to do next. So I decided to talk to somebody who did. Um, I am involved with the WP Campus organization. You've heard that talk about at basically every higher ed talk that's, that's been here so far. Um, and if you see uh, Rachel floating around somewhere, um, uh, she recruited me and my colleague John McFarland to co-host uh, the WP Campus podcast, a monthly podcast where we talk about the WordPress and higher ed stuff. And Rachel probably thinks I do it because I care about the community or I care about WordPress or something like that. That's not why I do it at all. I do it because this is an excuse for me to talk to somebody who has solved my problems already in some other institution. So that's exactly what I did. I reached out to somebody, uh, Shelly Keith, who had done a lot of governance work at the University of Mary Washington. You can listen to that episode uh, at that link right there. And. Um, Shelly and I had a great conversation in the abstract about web governance, and then I stole all of her ideas and applied them to my problem. And some of the core ideas that I really appreciated from Shelly were things like uh, what she called a, uh, a bill of rights for her users. Um, so the idea is that you don't want it to seem like you're a centralized somebody imposing rules. Instead, you want to, you want to make it feel more like uh, they're well-defined, rights that your users have and you're sort of building up from those as core principles. And so we created some, some rights. Uh, first, the rights of the users who are coming to our website, that they have the right to up-to-date and accurate content, accessible content, and just a positive user experience. I, I hope we could get everybody on board with that. Um, and then we also have the second set of rights for all of our content creators, which is everybody in OIG, that they have access to content comprehensive documentation and editorial and technical support as they need, and then if they have data requests like analytics data and things like that, we will provide them uh, to them. So we built our, our governance document up from there. There's a lot of extra stuff that's very NC State specific, but that's really the core of it. Um, and I took that to my management, and well, first I worked with my communication staff, Ron, and, uh, and a couple of other people to really hone, hone the document, and then I took that to the management, and they said, yeah, this looks great. Um, I don't think they really realized that what that meant is that I had a mandate to make rules, and I would impose order with my iron fist. Um, so I worked with some of my colleagues to decide what are the, the core things that we need to make sure that we have a good website, and we set the bar incredibly high to start with. Rule number one, every page has to have a title. Uh, that's not a huge bar, but we have we had a lot of pages that people, for some reason, they like to look at a page without a title. Um, so we uh, we made a rule: every page has to have a title, <laughs> and we also made it so that there's a way to hide the title if you need to. But I really try to discourage people from doing that. Uh, rule number two is that every page has to have somebody who's responsible for it. 
Um, that's also not earth shattering, but uh, <laughs> it was a problem that we had. Content was created, and then uh, whoever created it left the university, and nobody wanted to actually take responsibility for it, even if it was associated with their service. We also wanted to make sure that all the content on the website was reviewed at least once a year. You didn't have to make updates, but you had to at least look at it and say, this is still correct, this is still relevant information. And then everything had to fit into the overall information architecture. Uh, in WordPress, uh, practically speaking, that means everything has to have an assigned parent page, uh, except for the top level navigation items. Uh, and that's just to make sure that we don't have any, uh, any orphan pages. Now we have a, a menuing system that auto generates based on that parent child structure. So we've made all the rules, and there are lots more rules that I want to make, but I need to have some way of actually enforcing these rules. And so then comes the accountability phase. And so again, I turned to the higher ed community and found somebody who had solved my problem for me. And that is uh, Stephanie Leary, who was mentioned in Jonathan's talk earlier. Uh, she created this plugin called the Content Audit Plugin. It's available on the uh, WordPress plugin directory. And what that allows us to do is, um, uh, first I created users, dummy users, in our WordPress installation for every assignment group in our call tracking system, our support system. Using this plugin, a uh, uh, plugin stores in custom fields, a content owner, and a content expiration date. So I assigned ownership to, uh, to each page with some help to figure out who was supposed to go with what um, to a, a call, tr uh, call tracking group. And then when that expiration date is hit, the plugin generates an email that goes into our call tracking system and will notify them, hey, this is out of date, you need to do something about it, you need to look at it. That still doesn't really solve everything. Um, it gets us a lot of the way there because, uh, because our call tracking system is fantastic at just bothering you and bothering you and bothering you until you resolve that issue. Um, so once that email gets in there, somebody's going to have to do something. But there's no way to ensure that what they do is they don't just go into the page and remove ownership from themselves. So now we need to figure out how to enforce our rules. And so here we created a custom plugin, the NC State Content Helper. Uh, it is available on GitHub. Don't judge me too harshly because, like I said, I don't actually know what I'm doing. This is terrible procedural PHP and it's incredibly messy. But it basically works. Um, so the NC State Content Helper. Uh, it tests the page metadata, these things like title and ownership and expiration date, things like that. Um, when you click the publish button, a little JavaScript script runs and tests all of that data. Um, if the page passes those tests, it's published, or those changes are saved, and you're good, everything's great. If it fails a test uh, that's been marked as, a, as an error rather than a warning, um, that is saved as a draft, and there's nothing you can do to save it as a as a published page until you resolve those issues. And so, just to show you a little bit how that works, we have a um, we have an options panel that uh, lists each of the different rules that we're enforcing. Some of them are those rules that I talked about before. Some of those are best practices. Um, and each each rule that we have has an option for being off. It doesn't get tested. Has a warning where it will tell you, "Hey, you should do this," but I'm not going to stop you from publishing the page. Or an error, in which case, if you if you uh, violate the rule, uh, you will not be able to publish the page. So, like I said, warning or error status. Uh, here's a little snippet of JavaScript for testing the, the title, and then um, down here we have the admin notice that generates. Um, you can see a uh, you know, larger larger view of the admin notice. This, this page doesn't have a title. You must give it a title. Until then, it will be saved as a draft, and then a linked documentation explaining why it's important to have page titles, which is one of those things that I never really thought I'd have to explain, but it's one of those things you have to explain sometimes. And then again, like I said, if it is an error, um, it's by, uh, an error status rule that's been violated, then the page will be saved as a draft. And so it doesn't matter how many times you push that publish button, it will never be published, unless you're an administrator like me, because I made it so that I can break my own rules. Um, how do you do that? You, you filter on save post, which I was surprised to discover was very easy to do. There's a lot of things that you can do at that action of pushing the publish button, and you can, you can uh, uh, make WordPress do lots of things, and I'm a little scared of that. 
but uh, this has worked really well for us. So now we have all these reasons for unhappiness that we now address. Now we have a way of addressing out of date content because people will be bothered to look at it at least once a year. It will never be more than a year out of date. And now we have, we've addressed this issue of who's responsible because now somebody is actually responsible. There's a name or an assignment group that's associated with it. But there's this other issue of bad content. And bad content can be lots of things. It could just be badly written. It could be just totally unnecessary. And it can be inaccessible. And this accessibility question is really key to me. I can't decide programmatically um, whether something is poorly written or just not necessary. And I don't have the time as myself to go through and read every page and decide that. But I can do something, at least something, about accessibility. And so that's where we built our, another custom plugin, the NC State Accessibility Helper. And what that does is when you click publish, it again tests your content, everything that's in the main WordPress editor for different accessibility issues. It generates an annotated preview beneath the editor in the meta box that highlights anything that you've done wrong, that violates any of these accessibility rules. And then for each issue that's been detected, it links to outside learning resources to help you understand how to not do that in the future. And so just a quick look at how that works. Um, uh, this is very simple code for uh, sticking the content in a meta box. Um, and that'll look something like this. This is inside the meta box right below the editor. Uh, we use the Axe Accessibility Engine, which is an open source JavaScript library for testing uh, accessibility. It's built to avoid false positives, which is good, and it's very easy to use. And so uh, just a quick code snippet for uh, running that Axe instance. And then uh, we use JavaScript again to build our annotation and highlight the, uh, highlight the issue in that meta box. And that's going to look something like this. Uh, here we have somebody who has uh, made the, this line of text a color that is not, uh, does not have enough color contrast. And so that, that span has been highlighted in that orange box. And off to the side, there's an annotation that says, uh, this is a serious issue, uh, the ranking of the um, type of issue is built into X. The message is also built into X. Elements must have sufficient color contrast. And if you click that link, it goes out to an external learning resource. We've also added some custom tests to provide additional information. So for instance, X, if it sees that you have uh, alt text on your image, it won't flag that as a problem. But I want to make sure that my users are actually thinking about their alt text. So any image that has alt text I'm going to give them this little info box that says, make sure you're actually doing something smart with your alt text. Make sure you're actually describing the contents of your image. And the key here is that our content helper and our accessibility helper don't solve any problems on their own. These are not solutions to our problems, and they're also still very buggy in development. But they are helpers that give our users, give our content creators, the extra push they need to help figure out how to build good pages and good content. So the process for these, for these users now goes something like this. Uh, they get a support ticket that's notifying them that they need to do something about a, a piece of content. They go and edit that page, and if they make any issues, or if they create any issues, or if they, there were any outstanding issues previously, they're given these notifications, either an admin notice or in this meta box, and then hopefully they're, they're taking the hand and fixing it. So raise your hand if you think this plan is going to work. Yeah, I'm getting a few hands now. I don't know. I'm honestly not sure. Um, so there's a lot that doesn't work about this. This is not a content strategy. This is a content treading water and not letting it get any worse. Um, I still think we really would benefit from an actual communication staff that is capable of handling the workload that we put on them. But this is what we can do to trust our users and help put them uh, on, on the right track. So in terms of broader lessons, or why you should care about this thing that we did at NC State, um, let's go back to the moral of the story. And as you remember, the moral of the story was don't do what we're doing, <laughs> which is not actually the moral I told you. Uh, the other alternative moral is steal good ideas from the higher community and pass them off as your own, which is basically what I did with the governance plan. My management loved that plan. And it's all ideas that I just took from Shelly Keith. I do credit her in the plan, but I don't think anybody reads the footnotes. <laughs> um, so the actual moral story that we started with 
find ways to trust and empower your content creators. And that's really, that's really the central lesson that I learned here. And I think that you can take it to everything that, that you're doing too, because I may have more content creators on this particular website than anybody else should have. Um, and I may have reluctant content creators, because hopefully the people who are working on your websites actually want to be working on your websites. Uh, but there are still lessons that can be learned and scaled to any organization, big or small. And, so, and what, I, what I'm getting at here is that there are these universal challenges for any time that you have more than one person working on a website. You have to coordinate and train your content creators to get everybody on the same page, maintain quality standards, and just keep everything up to date. And in higher ed, we really love creating lots and lots of content. And there are solutions to those challenges, or at least ways of addressing those challenges, that are available to us in WordPress. You can use custom fields to store editorial metadata the way that Stephanie Leary's plugin does. You can use admin notices and meta boxes to provide in-context feedback to your content creators so that they're seeing, as they're publishing, the things that maybe they need to improve. And then, if you really need to give your content creators a really hard nudge toward, the, toward good behavior, you can filter on safe posts and um, prevent them from actually publishing. So, with that in mind, please uh, steal my ideas and let me know what you do with them. Uh, steal ideas from the rest of the higher ed community. That really is the way to go. And uh, while we're here, uh, feel free to tell me what else we should be doing to try to manage this terrible, terrible website that we have. So, thank you. The microphone is right there if you'd like to uh, step up and ask. Uh, if anybody doesn't have any questions, I'm just going to improv up here for a moment. All right, Mike. Yeah, so, I love the idea of the accessibility checker. Um, we're using a page builder layer. Um, and what I've seen with Yoast and other checkers that kind of analyze the content is that is a bridge too far for them. It doesn't even look into it. Uh, and you have, have you tried it with any page builder type apps? And, this also would layer into uh, Google Earth that might become that type. Yeah, so uh, the question was about page builder apps and whether or not the accessibility helper would check the, and evaluate that content. I don't know. Uh, we don't use those uh, page builder apps in this website. We do in other websites, and we're starting to roll out our accessibility helper in other places on campus, but we're not at a point where we've tested that. I will say that all the accessibility helper does is it checks the, the contents of the content, the, the WordPress function, whatever is output by that. So if you're doing a lot of things with like advanced custom fields where that that content is not being stored in the content, it's being stored in the, the post meta, that's not going to be detected. But if the page builder you're using is populating everything right into the, uh, the WP posts table into what would normally be the content, um, that should be evaluated at least in some way, but I, your mileage is going to vary. Yeah, if you want to come up to the microphone. Uh, I'll just yell out. Apologize if I missed it at the beginning, but the accessibility plugin, uh, it said it was in a GitHub repo. Where would we find that? Yeah, so um, uh, it's linked. The, there's a link to the GitHub repo in these slides, so if you want to head to the slides, and I'll also tweet out the link to it. Um, and I'll just reiterate that my code is terrible because I don't know what I'm doing, so please don't judge me too harshly. Yeah. All right, thanks for sharing. Any other questions? Yes, you want to jump over to the mic? I'll try to look. Um, Actually, we need to... Sir. 
please tell me. Yeah. I'm sorry, I can't hear. I was just going to say, Yoast has a readability score, that might be helpful. Yeah, and I, I have seen that. Um, I'm not quite ready to turn on uh, Yoast for, all, for, for this site because I don't, I think that's going to confuse some of my users, but um, maybe you can uh, steal that part of it. Yeah, yeah so, all right, it looks like we're out of time, but um, if anybody would like to talk to me about anything else, please uh, find me. I'll be